All right, what's happening, y'all? It's your boy Rico from Street Scores, and there's a lot to talk about today. Most notably, Antonio Gandy-Golden, former fourth-round pick from a couple of years ago, is moving the tight end. And I think it's really interesting because does he honestly have a better chance of making the team at tight end than receiver? I know receiver is really deep right now, but don't sleep on the tight end position. So we're going to take a look at both of those position groups and really figure out which one he has a better chance of making the team with. Also, we got a couple of updates on some of our preseason games. We know when they'll happen, where they'll happen and everything like that. Of course, we got to talk about everything going on in practices so far, including the Antonio Gandy Golden thing, but also so it's been reported by John Com that Kelvin Harmon is out there looking pretty good. It's early, but we got to talk about that as well. Also, a little bit of news on Percy Butler as far as whether or not he's ready to step up and be that true third safety right out the gate if we had to play a game today. Also, Cole Holcomb talking about whether or not he's ready to actually step up at the Mike Linebacker spot. Also, Jimmy Moreland was released by the Texans. Should we go and look at him again? Should we bring him back? For depth. Also, some really interesting stats for Samuel Cosme that even I'm a little shocked about. Also, some stats comparing Sam Howe to Trevor Lawrence, both of their first 19 career starts. Also, Fanalytics has us ranked very low in top NFL fandom rankings. And I'm going to explain why there's no way the Washington Commanders should be as low as they are. And also, Chad Johnson showing love to not only Terry McLaurin, but another receiver on this team. And I'm going to dive into why I love that so much and why I'm so happy to see that. But before we dive into all of that, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell next to the subscription button so you get notification immediately. And every time I release an informative and opinionated video just like this one, the film sessions are on the way. I'm going to start getting those out to y'all this week, starting tomorrow as in Monday. So be on the lookout for all of those. I'm so excited to finally get those done. And then probably in the middle of that or maybe after I'm done, I'll get my draft review and grade out there as well. I also want to do a live stream kind of checking in on everybody on how y'all feel about the draft. And I'll open up the phone lines for y'all to call in. And then later on, maybe when we have some more dead time where it's not a lot of things going on, probably that period between mandatory mini camps and training camp where there's like literally nothing, I want to do a live stream where we kind of check back in and i want to get a feel for how everybody feels about the name logo jerseys helmets all of that type of stuff especially now that we're getting pictures from like mini camps and otas and things like that where we'll actually see it on the players so that's gonna kind of be like a checkup on everybody to see how everybody feels i'll open up the phone lines for that as well and of course i'll be looking at the comment section just to see how everybody feels about the new rebranding and all of that after a few months of letting it settle in so be on the lookout for all of the videos all of the live streams coming up is going to be a lot and Without further ado, let's get it. All right, so first of all, before we dive into AGG, Kelvin Harmon, Percy Butler, Cole Holcomb, and all of the practice notes so far, it's been reported that the Washington Commanders will play the Panthers in Maryland for the first preseason game, August 13th at 1 p.m. And then we know we play Kansas City in Kansas City for our second preseason game, but we don't exactly know when yet. But we do know it's been reported that Saturday, August 27th will be when the Washington Commanders play the Ravens in Baltimore for the final preseason game at 4 p.m. And why do we always play in Baltimore? Every time I remember us playing a preseason game against Baltimore, it's always in Baltimore. Even the most recent preseason game I went to for the Washington Commanders was in Baltimore just a few years ago. Is there something to that that I'm missing? Also, wanted to go ahead and announce, and I'm a little sad about this, but we will not be having any joint practices this summer. Now, there were talks that we may have joint practices with the Bills in March, and maybe that J.D. McKissick situation ended up canceling that whole thing. I guess maybe Maybe we kind of burned a bridge there. Who knows? Which is really interesting because Ron Rivera has basically had contact with the Bills and their GM and all of that on how to build the Washington Commanders since he's been here. I mean, they said it's like almost daily contact, at the very least weekly contact, looking for advice from that team. So that J.D. McKissick situation, if that really burned that bridge, that's going to suck. So I'm not sure if that's why we're not having a joint practice. I'm just guessing. 
but I wouldn't be surprised if that was a reason. But again, it's confirmed through John Com that we will not have a joint practice this summer. I guess the only positive from that is that we don't have to risk a D Hop versus D'Angelo Hall situation. Other than that, I would love to have joint practices. I think it's really cool that the Eagles and the Dolphins are having joint practices. So it's Tua versus Jalen Hurts. I mean, that's fun to watch even as a Washington Commanders fan. I want to tune in just to see how that goes, even as a non-Dolphins or Eagles fan. And now moving on, let's start with Antonio Gandy Golden. Well, as many of y'all may know, maybe some of y'all may not have heard yet, but Antonio Gandy Golden is full blown making the move to tight end. Remember when he was drafted, he was 6'4", but only 225 pounds. But he does have the type of frame that he can bulk up and carry much more weight, which is what he would have to do. His 40 time was a 4'6", which was kind of better than I thought it would be at 6'4", 225 pounds. His three cone was a 7'3", 3", and then he had 22 bench reps, which is really good, and he had a 36-inch vert, which you would hope would be better, but that's not terrible, and then he has 32-inch arms, and he even on tape in college was able to bully corners when blocking in the run game. Now, of course, making a full-blown move to tight end and going from blocking corners that you played against at Liberty to going against NFL defensive ends and edge rushes, that's a completely different thing. So that's not an easy transition at all. But I think there may be something to work with there. But I think honestly, he's going to have to get to probably at least somewhere around 240 for it to make sense for his move to tight end. And, and it worked out with us previously. I mean, we had Ricky Seals Jones who moved from wide receiver to tight end. And that worked out fairly well for us. Well enough to where, first of all, that big play he made against the Giants was beautiful. And with the Taylor Heineke almost game winning touchdown immediately after the JD McKissick fake out wheel route that he did against that one Giants linebacker. And then also good enough to where the Giants felt like after we released them they scooped him up immediately after we decided we weren't bringing them back the giants were on it immediately they saw firsthand what he can do and so ricky seals jones wasn't the best tight end of all time of course but he showed that you can transition from receiver to tight end and it can work out you cannot be a completely abysmal blocker he was never a really good blocker at all in any way shape or form but it wasn't like he was a complete liability when he was on the field. Kind of like, I mean, as much as I love Jordan Reed, and you can argue he was one of the best peer receiving tight ends in NFL history, but when he was on the field, we couldn't run the ball, especially not his way, because he was literally abysmal at blocking. I'm hoping AGG isn't that bad, but we'll see. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. We have plenty of off season to see, plenty of practices, OTAs, mini camps, mandatory mini camps, all of that type of stuff. And of course, training camp if he makes it that far. Shouts out to Ed Oliver, first of all, because he was the first person I saw that reported AGG moving the tight end. I think from John Com. Also, shouts out to Louis T, because he was the first one that I heard talk about how he saw pictures of AGG actually doing the little blocking dummy exercises where he had another tight end holding it for him. So it was showing that he was working with the tight ends and he was doing blocking drills. So it was safe to infer that he was making a move to tight end. And then shortly afterwards, Ed Oliver reported from John Com that he was actually for real making the transition from wide receiver to tight end. But again, like I talked about in the intro, my point is, is that even a smart move for him? Because I know receiver is deep. You have Terry McLaurin. You have Jahan Dodson. I think Dax Milne may even make the roster. We'll see. You have Curtis Samuel, of course. Deami Brown, they're very high on him. Cam Sims is already our niche, big, tall receiver. Outside of the tight end group, the receiver with some serious height on him that's highest on the depth chart is Cam Sims. Probably only him. Then you also have Alex Erickson in the receiver room, technically. But he's brought here as a pure returner to basically replace DeAndre Carter. And there's a strong chance that he'll make the team unless they feel like Jahan Dotson can do it, even though I doubt it. I think they view him too highly to even allow him to do too much returning, even though he shows on tape that he can do it pretty well. But I think they prefer to like maybe go with a safer Dax Milne or go with the dynamic Alex Erickson. But at the same time, if he can't contribute much in the receiving room, that's an entire roster spot designated to somebody that's only returning for you, which isn't a bad thing that can work out but you would prefer if your returner can also contribute in the wide receiver room but out of the way i mean it's so deep you have jaquez ezzard who ed oliver compared to like a steven sims type of guy but like steven sims the year that he was really good so that's really intriguing in itself also i'm just now figuring out today that jaquez ezzard is from atlanta so now like i'm severely rooting for that man to make the team come on now i mean college park and everything hold on what part of college park i'm about to look that up after i'm done recording this my boy jaquez from i 
I should have known from the name. And then you also have Kyrie McGowan. I mean, a handful of guys that were brought in recently as undrafted free agents that they're going to get a good look at. I mean, Mark and Michael. And then who we're about to talk about next, Kelvin Harmon. Apparently, he's balling and we're going to dive into that as well. But I mean, this receiving group is actually really deep, which is a really good problem to have. That's the type of problems you want on your team. But the receiver group is really deep. And I see why it would be very difficult for Antonio Gandy Golden to make this team for sure. But then we're talking about moving the tight end. And logically, of course, if he can't make it in the receiver room, that sounds like a good idea. But then when you look at the tight end room, who does he make it over? You already have Logan Thomas as your pretty much number one tight end when healthy. Really good dual threat tight end. Not the best receiver. Also not the best blocker. But he's good slash good enough at both to where he's a true dual threat tight end. And I think when healthy, a top eight tight end in the NFL. Then you have John Bates, who's a really good blocker. Not a true separator, but has really good hands. And we saw him getting all kinds of yards after catch when he was running people over, especially in the Cowboys game. He was like the only player in that entire game that showed heart even while we were getting blown out so i'm really excited about the future of john bates but also he's just a really solid tight end too because at the very least he's gonna block very well and then we'll just figure out the receiving part later on but like i always say man what there's only like a handful of tight ends in the nfl that actually separate on their own anyway most of these tight ends out here are gaining separation are getting open because of the offensive coordinators and they're scheming them open they're using receivers as distractions and all kinds of stuff and getting the tight ends out there either late maybe like in the flat it's like a late release after blocking or again receivers running crossers and then the tight end falls underneath as like a check down option whatever either way the vast majority of tight ends in the nfl even george kittle is schemed open by his offensive coordinator so i'm not too worried about john bates inability to separate because not a lot of tight ends can do that anyway it's really just darren waller travis kelsey maybe another two one or two guys out there so as long as you can catch what's thrown towards you and you can block i'm happy then you have Cole Turner, who, honestly, out of all of the Titans on the roster right now, has the best and the safest receiving potential. Because, again, John Bates is a good receiver and a good blocker, but John Bates is a better blocker than Logan Thomas. Cole Turner is definitely a better receiving target than Logan Thomas. At least I'm assuming he will be projecting them to the NFL level. Catch radius slight ability to separate he can even kind of get open deep downfield a little bit when he starts to catch his stride so i think he's going to end up being our best red zone target then you have samus reyes who has all of the potential in the world just extremely raw because he's literally never played any football in his life until we signed him like he didn't even know what cover two was at first like he had no idea about anything anything that we take for granted as far as football knowledge goes because we grow up loving the sport since we're little i mean by the time we're in elementary school we know what zone coverage means he didn't i mean he's as raw as it gets but at the same time he's technically measurables wise and testing wise the most athletic tight end to ever touch the nfl and so that still in there is crazy and he even has the floor as a really physical blocker he may not be the most technically sound like a john bates or a logan thomas but if we're talking about physicality they already say that he's easily the most physical blocker on our team and then with that athleticism of course there's receiving potential but he's got to learn how to catch and run routes first and then you have curtis hodges who's I, I think the tallest receiving target out of the wide receivers and tight ends out of our entire team i think he's six seven and then you have armani rogers who to me is probably one of my most exciting players on the roster i mean the ceiling is ridiculous he literally, if you're looking at his testing and his athletic profile and even a little bit of what he did at the East West Shrine Bowl practices, he's literally, if you want to keep him at his size, make him lose a little bit of weight, he could literally have a Chase Claypool type of ceiling. Or if you let him gain some weight, he has a Darren Waller type of ceiling. I mean, it's just so much potential in this tight end room. I'm so excited. It's one of my most exciting position groups. I would say offensive line is our best position group. I would say as of right now, linebacker is our worst. And you can argue that corner or maybe even D-line in the near future will end up being one of the position groups we have to worry the most about. But as of right now, not saying the tight end room is our best position group, but it's easily the most exciting for me. Of course, outside of quarterback, because quarterback matters most, but ignoring positional value, tight end is easily the most exciting position group on this team, I think by far for me, because just all of the athletic freaks and the crazy ceilings that we have. And Armani Rogers is leading the way. He may not have the exact ceiling of a Samus Reyes, but if Samus Reyes has the 1A ceiling, Armani Rogers has 1B. 
I mean, he's right there with them. The athletic profile is ridiculous. And he's a former quarterback in college like Logan Thomas. We've already seen how that can work out well for us. So, hey, get Armani Rodgers in the same thing. If you want to move him to tight end, he's going to have to gain some weight. Or you can try to make him lose some weight and become like a bigger receiver like a Chase Claypool. Out of the way, man. If we can get either one of those from him, I'm super excited. And so that brings me back to the point that where does Antonio Gandy Golden fit into this? Because he's not like an athletic freak like Sam Reyes or Armani Rogers. He's not the height of Curtis Hodges. He can't block anywhere near as well as John Bates, Logan Thomas, or Sam Reyes right now. So he's already behind as far as blocking goes by far. And then even receiving wise, again, some of these tight ends that weigh more than him him and are bigger than him or even faster than him so we'll see man i mean maybe he can gain some weight and somehow keep that four six speed then i will be much more optimistic about that but as of right now antonio gandy golden is not looking good and again we got to talk about kelvin Harmon up next because apparently he is shining in off-season workout so far remember sixth round pick from 2019 tore his acl before the 2020 season and then when he came back in 2021, he was only a practice squad player, wasn't looking too great. I, I liked what I saw, but apparently the commanders didn't. So he ended up getting released, never picked up by another team, I believe. We ended up bringing him back. And now this offseason, the 2022 offseason, apparently he's one of the brightest spots so far in practices. So I'm really excited about the potential of Kelvin Harmon because I remember when we drafted him. I felt like it was a huge steal in the sixth round. So if he can somehow emerge you know a well into a, over a year after tearing his acl in his recovery process and probably getting some of that athleticism back some of that quickness back or probably even getting quicker and faster just off of working out and getting into an nfl exercise program and then i mean of course he's a big body jump ball receiver and again outside of the tight end room cam sims is probably the only big receiver that we have that's slated to make the roster so kelvin Harmon can go out there and really look good he may find a way to make this team when we get to the 53 man roster who knows and then before we move on to cole holcomb talking about how well he can play the mike linebacker role and the fact that he's ready it's been reported through john com that percy butler doesn't particularly look ready right now now there's loads of potential and Ron Rivera and a lot of the coaching staff love him and believe that maybe by week one he'll be ready but as of right now there's still some raw elements to his game so if we had to play a game today Percy Butler would not be ready to be out there as basically your permanent third safety that's out there most of the time like Ron Rivera said out there at least minimum 53% of the snaps he's not there yet but there's no reason to believe that he won't be there as of week one also it was really interesting because we claimed offensive tackle drew himmelman off of waivers like we earned that there may have been other teams that wanted them and we ended up getting them but then i mean he made it only like a couple of days we ended up releasing them he was like a big athletic freak he's like six eight something crazy he was one of the denver broncos undrafted free agents from last year's pool and so i was really interested in seeing what we end up doing with them and then he only survived like a couple of days so i did want to mention that but it's not really any real news because he's not even on the team anymore and then nicole holcomb he talked about his chance at possibly taking over as the mike linebacker for the washington commanders this upcoming season he said quote i feel like i'm gonna take control of the defense and take charge of the mike spot i've been wanting it for a while and i like that responsibility to take control and get everybody lined up make the adjustments we need to make he also said i feel real comfortable in that position i was calling the defense all last year i had a little bit of that responsibility the year before i felt like i've grown a lot in terms of being comfortable in those situations and to be completely honest as far as cole holcomb mike linebacker role is not ideal but i don't think it's hit the panic button bad like of course i would love to bring in a veteran they could probably take over as the Mike linebacker and then you have Cole Holcomb more as the outside and you have Jamin Davis moving more to like a will linebacker spot. I think that's ideal, but I don't think Cole Holcomb at the mic is like panic mode. Our defense has no chance of being really good to elite because Cole Holcomb is the Mike linebacker. I think he actually played very well last year. Again, I prefer him outside, but he's definitely improved a lot in the Mike linebacker spot. I think a lot of it, of course, was learning how to call plays because we gave that responsibility to John Bostick last year 
year we pretty much just assumed that he would dominate that role as far as like being the quarterback of the defense then after he got hurt we started to throw that more on Cole Holcomb it was an adjustment period but he started to learn and started to get better and better as the season went on he improved in coverage everything and most importantly as far as Mike linebacker goes not even just being the quarterback of the defense but can you stack and shed can you engage with offensive linemen get rid of them and make tackles in the run game at the line of scrimmage rather than five yards down the field after the running back has already picked up a good chunk of yards that's the thing I'm really going to keep my eye on with Cole Holcomb that's one of the main reasons I want to bring in like a true Mike linebacker a bigger guy that's willing to go head to head with guard centers and tackles get rid of them and then make a tackle in the backfield or at the line of scrimmage on running backs that's one thing I'm worried about with Cole Holcomb but as far as like getting the defense where they need to be all of the pre-snap stuff and all of the intelligence IQ and being the quarterback of the defense stuff I'm not really worried about that he showed us last year that he could handle that again it was a little bumpy in the beginning because we didn't even really allow him to do that that much during the offseason because again we assumed John Bostick would be there and would stay healthy and be able to do that even though he was a liability in every other way he was a really good on the field coach and then as soon as the ball was snapped he became the worst player on our defense easily but pre-snap though he was balling but as soon as that ball was hyped, boy, John Bastick went from an 85 overall to a 35. And so again, Cole Holcomb, of course there were bumps in the road because we didn't even give him the reps in the offseason necessary for him to be ready to take that position over for an entire regular season at the NFL level. But after, you know, going through his bumps and making his mistakes, by the end of the season, he became a really good Mike linebacker mentally. But again, I'm worried about the strength and the ability to just go toe to toe with offensive linemen, just straight up. I wish he just had a little Rashawn Evans in him remember Rashawn Evans from Alabama I believe he may still be on the Titans but he hasn't been as good at the NFL level as he was for Alabama but if he had some of that just disregard for human safety and just bulldozing and blowing up offensive alignment if Cole Holcomb added that to his game he would easily be a pro bowler and then moving on shouts out to Nathan Coleman on Twitter he brought up some interesting stats for Samuel Cosme. He was third best in run block win rate amongst all NFL tackles. He had the fifth highest pro football focus overall grade for a rookie tackle since 2017 with a 74.9. And he ranked 11th overall in pro football focus run blocking grade as a rookie and he missed games. And the most notable part about him missing games is that when he came back, he didn't even look like his former self. So it took him a while to get back to what he used to be. So his grade was brought down even lower because after he returned from injury he was clearly not himself and I'm expecting big things from him moving forward also another interesting stat comparing Sam Howell to Trevor Lawrence their first 19 career starts in college Trevor Lawrence has a 3% better completion percentage but Sam Howell nearly threw 1,000 more yards threw 14 more touchdowns and only one more interception so I think that's really interesting right there because they're both the ACC they pretty much play the same people other than Trevor Lawrence like in the playoffs going against Alabama and teams like that other than that they pretty much have the same schedules so I found that very interesting especially since Sam Howell lost all of his weapons going into the last season poor guy speaking of Sam Howell you have Sam Howell Jahan Dotson and Brian Robinson taking the picture with the other rookies and I, I think it's just you know slightly interesting that between us and the Jets we're the only teams out there I believe with three rookies in the pictures I also like the fact that there's a lot of Georgia Bulldogs out there too as well I got my boy James Cook George Pickens Trevon Walker and Zamir White all standing next to each other from their different teams so I feel like the commanders represented very well and I'm sure the Georgia Bulldogs represented very well I'm assuming they have the most players there there's only about 40 50 of them also gonna do some a little bit of bad news and a little bit of good news the bad news is and of course you can take it with a grain of salt because it's just an article printed by a website named Fanalytics and his name is Mike Lewis he's an Emory marketing professor he ranked the NFL fan bases and he used all kinds of statistics and whatever data he has us ranked dead last with the Tennessee Titans 31 the Bengals 30 Cardinals 29 Jaguars 28 Bills 27 Jets 26 Buccaneers 25 Rams 24 Lions 23 Dolphins 22 and Colts 21 and we don't even know the other ones yet he's going back to front as far as how he's releasing them and not even being biased but that's definitely not right i mean even just the fact that we have fans everywhere like i mean we're one of the most global fan bases mostly because of what we did in the 80s and 90s but we're one of the most global fan bases as far as having fans in australia the uk brazil mexico germany i mean literally everywhere 
And of course, we have done a lot of losing, but I mean, our fan base is willing to travel even when the team is 0 and 16, they're pulling up to that 17th game. And a lot of fan bases aren't like that. I mean, for me, raised in Atlanta, I've seen the Falcons, they're two and five fans stop showing up at the games. And they have a great stadium. At least they're comfortable. They're in perfect weather, dome. If they need to open it up, if the weather's great enough outside, they got everything they need for a comfortable experience. Whereas our stadium is apparently like one of the worst in the NFL. If we're two and five, the fans are still out there. The main reason Washington fans have really stopped going to the games, even more than the losing, is just Dan Snyder. So putting us dead last. Last. I mean, of course, I'm not saying we're top five as of right now. 20 years ago, we were. And he even acknowledged that in the article. He said, quote, the commanders represent a true fall from glory. Washington was a top five or 10 brand when we began these rankings. Two decades of losing, poor talent acquisition, and long-term name controversy has pushed the club to the bottom of that list. Now, maybe he's done some research that I just don't know about, and maybe he's right, but I really don't. Dead last? Again, off of what I've seen from Falcons fans, I mean, I love Atlanta, but Falcons fans, man, them boys two and four, stadium empty. A lot of my friends don't even watch the games once it gets that bad, and that's not even that bad. Two and four isn't terrible. It's not like the season is over. And then on to some good news, my boy Chad Johnson, aka Chad Ochocinco, has a video recently where he's basically talking trash back and forth with Jahan Dawson, saying that he basically won't catch touchdowns against them one-on-one, -on -one, and they're about to go prove it, so I can't wait for that footage but i just love how much chad johnson is attached to our receivers he loves terry mclaurin he talked about it on the i am athlete podcast like a year ago or something when they were talking about underrated receivers and chad johnson was super high that was the happiest he got the whole show about a receiver talking about terry mclaurin i mean it just made him super smile he loves him and even if you follow chad johnson on twitter it was one time he was shedding tears watching terry mclaurin i can't remember what game it was or if it was like a practice or he was watching how it was something he was watching terry mclaurin and he literally had tears rolling down his face because he was like it's just so beautiful the way he runs routes is just one of the best route runners he's ever seen and he's just a huge terry mcclellan fan always tweeting at him and stuff like that and then now the fact that he's showing a lot of love to johan dotson too i think we have something going and the reason i think of chad johnson so highly first of all he's one of my favorite players and we can dive into that a little after this but i mean first of all no matter how much you may love or hate chad johnson you have to admit he's one of the best route runners in nfl history that's one thing he definitely has as far as the art of it the craft of it and so the fact that he's a fan of John Dotson and Terry McLaurin shows that he I mean there's no bias here he has no reason to have any bias towards the Washington Commanders he has no attachment at all he's from South Florida he played for the Cincinnati Bengals there's literally no attachment to the Washington Commanders and why he would show these guys love for any reason outside of the fact that they're very talented and they're very very good route runners so that's first of all and then also I just I'm very high on Chad Johnson one of my favorite players of all time I gotta have Daryl Green of course I gotta have Marshawn Lynch I gotta have all of my Westlake alumni same high school as me so of course Cam Newton Adam Pacman Jones AJ Terrell a little bit I still can't even put him in my top 10 players even though he is from Westlake but I'm rooting for him of course and then of course Malik Willis I'm rooting for him to go crazy and have a Hall of Fame career of course but Chad Johnson's easily in my top 10 as well man that's uh, maybe even in my top five is one of my favorite players of all time so that just makes me really happy again he's been showing Terry McLaurin love for years and talking about how bad his quarterback situations have been and how he deserves more love and then now Jahan Dotson as well as of just a couple of days ago yes sir I think very very highly of Chad Johnson so for him to show love that's big to me again not even just talent wise but just also I just I'm a huge Chad Johnson fan always was since I was little those are just my type of players Chad Johnson Ocho Marshawn Lynch Cam Newton Adam Pacman Jones Akeem Tlaib and Marcus Peters are really funny to me too but I wouldn't put them in my top 10 like those guys and of course I mean Daryl Green was just one of my favorite players always growing up even if I weren't a Burkney and Gold fan Daryl Green would have been one of my favorite players and Sean Taylor is like an automatic I mean that's really not even to be discussed but yeah man that's the end of this video please get in the comment section let me know how you feel about everything discussed in this video especially like do you think Antonio Gandy, Gandy Golden really has a chance of making this roster at tight end or receiver and if you had to pick one which would it be is it tight end by default just because we already know receiver is a big no but again I don't think tight end is a cakewalk at all I think it's just as slim as receiver but at least they're giving them a chance to see so definitely get in the comment section let me know how you feel about that about us not having joint practices about Kelvin Harmon shining right now are you excited about him and of course do you want to bring Jimmy Moreland back after he's been released by the Texans because I remember it being fairly close as to why he didn't make the roster 
Like they just wanted to keep Tory McTire. He was balling in the preseason and stuff like that. So we may still like Jimmy Moreland a little bit. He may still be on our roster, but I don't know. This regime didn't draft him, but they got to see him up close and maybe they'll bring him back. It's depth. And of course, do you feel like Cole Holcomb can handle the Mike linebacker responsibilities? Are you excited about Samuel Cosme hearing those statistics I gave y'all? Are you excited about Sam Howell's potential comparing him to Trevor Lawrence statistically and how he was better? Also, definitely get in the comment section. Let me know how you feel about these fan base rankings. 32nd out of 32 teams did last. There's literally no way. And of course, man, I appreciate the support, man. Please leave a like on this video if you liked it, if you learned anything. I know you learned at least something, so you're legally binded to leave a like on this video. And of course, I appreciate all the support, man. Shouts out to all of my sponsors, especially my Pro Bowl sponsors, whose name you see scrolling on the screen right now. Be on the lookout for all of the content, videos, and live streams coming up very soon. I'll catch y'all later. I'm out.